do it. <laughs> Our next presenter is from a company called Hyrology. You may not have heard of Hyrology. They are from Chicago. They have been a uh, very quickly growing startup. He is vice president of business development there. He's done an incredible amount of mentoring around startups here in Chicago and has really grown and made mature <coughs> a sales organization. But I'll let you talk about how much money they've been able to generate from that. But this is Kevin Bogart. Kevin, come on, stop. All right, I'm excited to be here. Well, maybe, maybe not as excited as Shelby, but I'm excited nonetheless. All right, so we're going to talk about how to build a sales machine uh, through hiring better salespeople, building a better sales team, and structuring some sales process. So I spent the last about 17 years in sales and sales management roles for mainly startup and entrepreneurial based companies, small businesses. And most recently, as Bruce mentioned, I led the sales organization at Hyrology. Had a really, really interesting run from three of us in a small hallway of a shared office space, no product, no customers, trying to figure out like what we were doing, to now today, uh, five years later, 160 employees, 4,000 clients, we're at a $20 million annual run rate, built this, this crazy, fast-growing business. And it's a lot through this, the strategies that I'll discuss today. And similar to Shelby, we made a ton of mistakes in growing the business. We did a few things right, but we really messed up a lot of stuff. So we'll talk through some of those pitfalls. And, and my goal is that you all take some stuff away that you can pull into your business to not make the same mistakes. Uh, feel free to ask questions as I go through. Happy to make this as interactive as you want. So the specifics that we're going to talk about, I think. The most important component of, of having a strong sales organization is your people. Um, so we're going to talk. We're going to spend the majority of the time talking about hiring and hiring the right salespeople. How many folks in the room are hiring salespeople right now, or maybe within the next six months? Okay, so a little bit over half. We all should be looking to hire salespeople all the time, right? We should be proactively looking for folks. We get the right person to knock on our door that could be could be a great salesperson for us, we should want them, even if we don't have room for them. They're going to help grow the organization. So we'll talk about sales hiring. Uh, we'll talk about sales process, so this, a step-by-step -step approach that we can follow to make sure that from the time of reaching out and prospecting, through closing a sale, through developing and supporting those relationships, what that process looks like. And I'll give you some examples and even leave you with a template on, on how to build and create and structure a best practice approach. And then we'll talk just a couple minutes on target market and generation, how to focus on a specific target and drive and make more leads. All right, so we'll kick it off with the hiring piece. I, I know hiring isn't easy. Hiring salespeople specifically is hard, but hiring in general is not easy and it's not core to what we do day to day. We're running a business and the people side of it is not easy for most folks. Salespeople specifically are always in demand. Good salespeople are not on the job market long because people want them. So we got to do everything that we can to make sure that we're on top of it and we run this process effectively because those folks aren't going to be sitting on a job market for, for very long. What I found, and I've hired hundreds of salespeople in my career, mediocre salespeople, not very good salespeople, are really, really good at selling themselves. <laughs> so they might not be good at selling products or services, but they know themselves better than anything and typically they're really, really good at selling themselves. So we have to really focus on the interview process and make sure that we really understand their background, their experience, what they're looking for, and if they're gonna be the right fit for our organization. Uh, salespeople are definitely products of their environment. So if you take a salesperson from, let's say a large corporation, that they had marketing support and collateral and case studies and testimonials and maybe like a hospital <coughs> thing, and you put them in a small business, that has no brand notoriety, it's never sold for a small business and doesn't have the marketing support, a lot of times they tank. So when you're going through the, the hiring process, really try to understand what has this person done in the past and will it link and, and be uh, viable to what you're gonna, they're going to be doing for you day to day. And then finally, hiring salespeople is difficult because a lot of times we're desperate. We need it. Someone quit, we have to fire someone, we need it now, and we make rash decisions. So this needs to be thought out and it needs to be process driven. 
So a few things to keep in mind when we're hiring salespeople. Uh, the first is, is resumes are marketing documents meant to get that individual an interview. So I see too many small businesses hiring off of past experience and what's on their paper. People don't always tell the 100% honest truth on resumes, right? So we really need to dive into their experience and understand what they've done day to day. Just like your job descriptions, your ads for attracting people, our marketing documents meant to get people to apply. Same thing with the resume. They're, they're trying to get a job. We need to look at more than just their experience. Uh, we don't often see salespeople leave organizations where they're performing well, where they're growing in the business, and where they're making decent money. So every time you ask someone why you leave, if you hear the, you know, the normal answer, ah, I need to change. I want, I want to do something different. It's time for me to make a move. That's not the answer. There's something behind that. So you really have to dig in, understand why. My favorite interview question is tell me more. Like, why is that? Tell me more. What happened? Why do you want to make a move? Why do you want to need to make a change? So it's, uh, it's important to really understand because, again, it's hard for good salespeople that are making good income and are growing and know what they're doing to not have to start over at a new company. Something's behind it. It's going to take some time for salespeople to be productive. In most industries, we found that it takes about six months for someone to ramp to full productivity. In your industry, it might be a little bit less, maybe less of a sophisticated sale. But still, it's going to take them some time to really understand your business, understand your target customers, your process, the services you provide. It's going to take time. So if you are thinking about maybe hiring more salespeople, let's say at the end of the year, at the end of the year is not the time to start recruiting. The time to start recruiting is now because it's going to take time once you hire them to get them up and ramp to production. <coughs> so let's talk about the hiring process. This is, uh, this is the, the steps of, and the recommendation that we create for our clients and that we actually do internally at Hireology as well. So this is the hiring process. We're going to spend a decent amount of time on this, this slide. Uh, first of all, it's a process. It's not an action. This isn't a one-time, I need to recruit someone, reactive, and, and hire. This is a process that you need to go through always. This should be ongoing. This isn't a, a one-time approach. The first step in this is a profile. So we all have job descriptions for the roles we're looking for, for salespeople or associates or production folks. We know what we're looking for and what the outcome is or what, what they need to do. But a profile is really about the behaviors. What makes someone successful? What's the outcomes? What should we be looking for? And what should this person be able to do 30, 60, 90 days in? Spend some time really thinking about that and, and benchmark with your top performers. What personality styles do those folks have? What have they done well in the past? What are we really looking for? What value system do we need people to have? What personality styles? The more we really understand what it's going to take for someone to be successful, the easier it's going to be for us in the interview process to pick the right folks. So a job profile is rarely done, but I think it's one of the most important parts of the hiring process. Because again, if you don't know who we're looking for, it's going to be hard for us to find that individual. And it doesn't need to be sophisticated. Just get a, uh, a sheet and start jotting down what personality should we be looking for, what behaviors, what are the outcomes we're going to need for this person to do. Once you have a profile completed, I think the biggest challenge that we face day to day is sourcing, finding folks. It's hard. It's not easy today. There's some interesting things happening in the employment environment. Number one, unemployment rate is obviously really low. But we're also seeing the labor pool not grow as fast as job opportunity growth is, is going. So job opportunity is growing about twice as fast as the labor pool. So it's hard today. So we need to do everything that we can to get out there and be present and, and showcase and market the opportunities that we have. Same thing with you all trying to find customers, right? It's the same process. We've gotten pretty good at digital marketing and social media and playing Google's game. We need to do the same thing on the sourcing side of our business. So my, my recommendation here is, are, are you all using job boards, Indeed, Career Builder, LinkedIn, to find folks? It's mainly job boards, right? Spending money on job ads to try to get folks to come in. Your job seekers are not typing in Indeed.com to find jobs, even though Indeed is the largest job board aggregator in the US today. More job seekers hit that than any other job page, but they aren't going to Indeed. They're going to Google, and they're typing in Chicago sales jobs. So if Indeed isn't showing up at the top search results in that Google search, that's not probably where we should be posting if I'm looking for salespeople in Chicago. The other dynamic that's happening right now is Google is taking over the job board posting game. 
So if you search any job in any geography, you'll see a box that pops up on the top. It's Google Jobs. So it's the same thing as like how they've taken over flights and real estate and cars and everything else. It's the top box. We have to be able to play Google's game and show up in that box of search results if you want job seekers in your area to, uh, to find out about you as a business. So we really need to optimize and think about where we're posting. So I'd recommend you do that Google search for your geography for the jobs you're trying to fill and you'll, you'll realize pretty quickly where you need to start posting jobs. The other thing is utilizing social media. So you should obviously be pushing out to your, your company's Facebook page or all your social media networks that you're hiring, but we should also get and engage our, our employees, all the people that work in the shop, get them to push out to their social media networks. That my employer, which is a great place to work, is hiring. Uh, if you know of anyone, please click here to learn more. And then the final component is where they come where they come to. We'll talk about branding in a second, but how can we brand our shops as great places to work and brand our organizations as an employer of choice? So we need to do a better job at creating this, this career branded site linked to your actual shop's website. So we'll talk about that in a second. So sourcing is an important component, again, because it's so challenging right now today. Once we've got a good qualified candidate funnel, we need to pre-screen those folks. This isn't an interview yet. I find a lot of people, once they get a resume, it's like, all right, let's schedule interviews. A lot of times, people are just applying for jobs, and they don't, they aren't really interested. You might be looking at resumes and reaching out to folks for interviews that we're just trying to fill unemployment quotas, maybe, just to apply for jobs. So if you send them via email a quick pre-screen, 10, 15 questions tops, true or false even, you know, uh, trying to better understand what they're looking for, you can weed out typically 30 to 40 percent of the folks that apply right away without having to invest any time in reaching out to individuals and scheduling interviews. So a quick pre-screen, true, false, you know, what have you done in the past, try to really understand could they be a good fit or not. I find many small businesses aren't doing phone interviews. It's an important step. Before you bring someone in, if you're starting with just in-person interviews, you've probably all been in a situation where someone comes in and you realize within like the first few minutes that they're not a good fit, and you can't be a jerk and kick them out after two minutes and say, "Yeah, thanks, but no thanks. You know, not not going to be the right fit." You have to waste a half an hour at least of your day talking to someone that that you know is not going to work. So do a quick phone interview. I recommend five to 10 minutes, quick conversation. Why do you want to work here? Why do you think you'd be a good fit? What have you done in the past that would link to success here? You know, talk just high level. What were you accountable for in the past, in the past and what do you want to do here? Important step, that, that initial phone interview. From there, I recommend two in-person interviews. You can do them separately in two different sittings. I've seen some organizations do them together, especially if timing, that job seeker doesn't have a lot of time. They want to make a decision quick. But the two, rec the two interviews that I recommend running, one is a resume review style interview. So again, diving into their past experience. What were you accountable for? How is your performance measured? Where did you rank on the team? What successes did you have? What failures did you have to overcome? And I would also preface that resume review style interview with asking them or telling them that you're gonna be uh, checking references. So I know it's hard to check references, and we'll talk about that in a second, but if you start that interview with, hey, I'm gonna to talk to all your past managers and supervisors before we go on, they'll know then in the outcome that you get, the answers that you get are usually a little bit more honest and in line with what you're looking for versus someone just sugarcoating it. So resume review, and the second interview is more of like a behavioral or situational-based interview. So we've all probably heard these questions, tell me a time when, or give me an example of, those are, those are great starts of questions because you're really understanding how people reacted in certain situations in the past, which is likely how they're gonna react in the future. So trying to understand those situations that they've been in and how they've reacted, really important and critical to understand. Also, the more you ask, tell me more, or why, after you ask the initial question, the more you're really gonna draw what the right answer is and what was the bottom of what they were, what they were saying. So, that interview process is obviously incredibly critical. The important part is that we're running every single step of the interview process in a consistent manner, and we're running every person through that same step. Really, the only way to run a legally compliant interview is to ask the same questions to every single person. And we're seeing more and more businesses get into discriminatory lawsuits because they're asking questions that they shouldn't ask, or they're, they're picking people not because someone scored better, but because maybe they've liked someone 
So there's some legalities that we got to think about here too to make sure that we're, we're asking the right questions and we're following this process effectively. And then if you can, put some sort of scoring component behind it. Typically we hire people that we like or that are like us. We should be really high, be hiring people that have the right behaviors and competencies needed for success in that specific job. So we need, to, we need to make sure that we're, even if it's light scoring, like what we recommend is just one to five for each question in the interview process. One being a poor answer, five being an excellent, and everywhere in between. At least putting a hard score behind the conversations that you're having can help a lot. Versus just, I like this person, I'd have a beer with them, I'm gonna hire them. Let's really try to think about what that score is and, and how they perform against their peers. All right, one step that's really helped us in our interview <coughs> process and hire process is shadowing. So we have all of our salespeople come in and we actually give them a lead list and have them call and try to set up meetings for us. So in the interview, they have a script, they actually sell for us. Set meetings, or if they're, uh, if they're interviewing for an account executive position, we'll actually be closing business. We'll give them a scenario, have them create a presentation and actually sell us in the interview stage. It's really interesting to see the response that you get, how engaged people are, how excited they are about the opportunity, how much time they put into prepping. Why not see how they react and how they interact before you hire them, onboard them, train them, and then realize that maybe this person isn't cut out for this role that we're hiring for. It takes a little bit of time to put together, but it's an important step. And then the final components, testing or assessments, references and verification, all important components as well. Testing, I would just recommend finding an assessment that works well for your organization. There's a ton of them out there, behavioral or personality based. I wouldn't rely just on the interview. I would also want to understand, does this person have the right background and the right personality fit to be successful in the job? References, I know picking up the phone and calling past managers and supervisors is hard. It's almost impossible now. There's a lot of legality around it. You can only say that this person worked for me from this day to this day. It's really it. But there's a lot of online tools now that can help make this process much easier. So if you Google online reference check, there, there's a lot of really inexpensive solutions. One that I like is a company called Skill Survey. It's like 40 bucks a reference check, and you get back this great report that shows all of the facts of that individual, what, what all their past managers and supervisors said about them. It's a really, really strong report. And it answers that question that everyone wants to know, would you hire that person again if, if you had the opportunity? It anonymizes everything so you can't tell what manager said what, but at least you get all that reporting and that feedback. And then finally, verification, background checks, drug screens, you know, quarter vehicle reports if they're driving for you. Important step as well. Please. What what are some of the things that you shouldn't ask if you are a reference or, or what are the things that can get you in trouble? Are you planning on starting a family? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That one will get you in trouble. I assume age. If age out background, even like some, some easy stuff, there's a fine line between asking someone even where they grew up, because there could be some biases on where they're from and what part of town they're from. If you have an employment attorney, I would ask them like what you can and can't ask, or maybe vet it through someone in HR consultant. You just gotta be careful. So my recommendation is cut out like the friendly banter, because that's a lot of times where people get in trouble. Have a script, read the questions, that's the interview. Same with like if, they, if somebody calls you as a reference, Talk about this. Yeah, if someone calls you about a past employee saying, hey, I'm about to hire this person that worked for you, tell me about them. How, what do they do? Um, how did they do? Would you hire them again? Really, I would be pretty tight to the best on what you say. I, I think the, the, the legal response is yes, they worked here from this day to this day, and that's really all you can say. Again, if you have an appointment attorney, I would ask them for that advice, yeah. So I've got a question then. The, the site that you mentioned that anonymizes the feedback, how is that Oh, more okay because all you're doing is erasing the name of the manager so to yeah. speak but the information that they're they're coming forward with is right. sort of this gray area so the way that companies like skill survey get around that legality is they have to have multiple managers providing that feedback to anonymize it on that one form so if one of the managers fills it out they won't finalize the form and send it back to that manager it has to be multiple people and then it anonymizes into that report yeah I have a uh, fun pre-screening tip if you want to get good bad candidates fast. Please. For the phone interview, uh, don't call them. Make them call you. And just put the instructions a, in an email. A, and if they can't call you on time, 
That's a great point. So are they paying attention to detail? Are they accountable? Do they really want this job? Because I'm sure a lot of us schedule interviews and nobody shows up. They don't. It's a great point. So have someone call you versus you calling them for that phone interview. Good advice. All right. So I know this process is probably a little bit more rigorous than we're all doing today, right? It's lengthy. That doesn't mean that it has to take a long time. Our clients that are running this, this exact process, the average time to hire, so time from I've sent in my application to the time that I get my offer letter and hired, it's 18 days. So they're running it pretty efficiently, which is about a week less than the national average. So just because it's a lot of steps doesn't mean that it's, it's gotta take a long time. The other thing is, is this can get a little pricey, right? Job ads are expensive, testing assessments, running this reference check, background checks, it, it, can, it can be expensive, but it is way less expensive than not doing this stuff, hiring the wrong person, and then having to rehire, retrain, re onboard, do all this stuff over again. Right? Is this strictly uh, for sales? It's a good, good question. So, yes, if it was for sales, any role in your organization, okay. you should be following a process. I think it's important for salespeople because salespeople are so hard to hire. Oh, our organization is any role. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right, so a few hiring best practices to wrap it up. Um, follow it, make it consistent, make it objective. I looked back early on in our business, and even though we sell hiring software, and this is the process that we follow, we swayed away from it because we needed to make quick decisions and we needed to ramp up and hire a lot of salespeople. And I just remember looking back, every time we, we went away from our process and skipped steps, we, uh, it bit us. So it's important to keep it consistent, make it objective, and follow through it. Uh, we asked any established or senior level salesperson that we've hired for uh, last three years at W2s. In California, you can't ask for this, so again, make sure you know what you can and can't ask. But I want to see the last three years they've increased their income year over year and that they you know, are telling me what their compensation expectation is and it actually does align to what they've made. I'll, I'll say that right in the first conversation we have. You know, we, we require a personality profile, a background check, a drug screen, and the past three years of W-2s. If they have an issue with it, they'll tell us right up front. Yeah? How do you feel about intelligent assessments or intelligence assessments like Wonderlic or other processes? Yeah, so uh, tests like Wonderlic or Caliper is another one that I like. They have a cognitive reasoning or applied reasoning or cognitive ability section. I think it's incredibly critical because a lot of the, the re research and results of what correlates specific points that correlate to job success the highest is, is IQ out of everything. Jo by the way, job experience is on the bottom. Job experience has the lowest or almost no correlation to on the job success. But things like IQ score higher, really the best thing that correlates is everything. Looking at a process that includes personality, the interview, reference checks, uh, job experience, etc. So I, I love them. What was the thing those again? Uh, well, he mentioned Wonderlic, which is a great profile. Uh, Caliper is another one with a P C A L I P E R that we use heavily. It, if you guys haven't taken any of these, they're pretty interesting. Every single one that I take, if they're worth it at all, you read this report when you finish it. You read this report of you to a T. It's crazy how they can get that that feedback and those results from the questions that they ask. Really strong. 50, 80, 100 bucks a pop usually, so it can get pricey if you've got a few candidates in the process, but man, it will help you make a better decision. So, and there's, there's tests like DISC, for instance, that will really help you better understand how to manage and motivate your current employees and what their communication and learning styles are. Um, it's great to benchmark current, current employees with these assessments too. All right, uh, reference check is an important piece. Make sure we're connecting with past managers. Um, I, can't, I can't remember who said, hire slow, fire fast, but in, in our businesses, especially fast growing small businesses, we, we don't have the luxury to do anything slow. We need to go through this process quickly. Again, especially with salespeople, they're not on the job market long. Um, again, invest in it. It's, it's more important to put money up front than it is to skirt around some of these steps and, and save money and then have to redo this process again. Uh, once you've hired them, I think one of the biggest misses for small businesses in regards to hiring is there's no structure to onboarding. So I can provide a template that, that we use for 30, 60, 90 day plans. So a really important step, make sure that before that person says yes to your job, that they have a really clear understanding of what's gonna be expected of them 30, 60, and 90 days in. What are the outcomes? What do you need to do? What goals do you need to achieve? 
to, within the first three months to make sure we collectively feel that this was a good hire and that you're the right fit and that we're the right fit for you. So the earlier in the process we can do that, preferably in, in the interview process, the better. Because what will happen is you'll start telling someone, all right, here's all the things that you'll need to do. Here's the tasks and activities that will get us to these goals. You know, how does that sound? You'll start to see people like, ah, it seems like a lot. I don't know if I'm cut out for this. That's exactly what you want. You want people pulling themselves out of the interview process before they say yes and, and, and you hire them and bring them on board. So it's a, again, a really important step and I can share a template to create those and, and that you can communicate it out. Building it is one thing and communicating is another. They should be reviewing this every week. For the first three months, every week you should be sitting down with them. Here's the goals that we need to achieve. What are we on pace for? What are we behind on? Making sure that we've got it lined up. All right. I'm not going to actually pull this up. This was Underground Printing, which is obviously a large organization. Their career brand is pretty strong. So if you go to their website, it talks about why it's a great place to work and the jobs that they have and what are their core values and the type of organization they are. If I was wanting to work in this industry and I saw this, it would entice me and make me want to apply. So if they're one of your competitors in your market, I would do whatever I can to build a strong career brand because people are looking at this and it's getting them excited and making them want to apply. So let's do a quick activity. I want everybody to get out their phone, go to your shop's website, and click on the careers or employment or jobs section of your site. <laughs> Do it on your mobile, please. Yeah, because 65% of all job searches now start on a mobile device. So they're on their way home from their commute for a job that they don't like, or they're on their lunch break, or they're in the middle of work. They're searching for jobs on their phone, not on their computer. The reason why I wanted to do this is because job seekers, I should say qualified job seekers, people that you would want to hire, are not just going to Indeed or Google Jobs and finding a job and applying. They're going to the business's website and they're researching and really trying to understand what it's like to work for that organization. And they want to know and, and find that out. So any feedback? First of all, a show of hands, how many people do not have that section of their shop's website? Okay, so the majority of us. It's an important piece. It's an easy piece, right? Throw a tab on your website that says careers and put some content in there. The important stuff that you should list out. What, what's in it for them? The whole site should show, if I'm a job seeker, why should I want to work for you? So what's a day in the life like? Throw in some employee, current employee testimonials. Why do people like to work there? How do you give back to your community? <clears throat> do you take part in any philanthropy? What open jobs do you have? We're always looking for good salespeople, right? You should always have a sales job open on that website. And then finally, we make, need to make it just like what Shelby was talking about with leads. The lead forms, really simple to apply. Really, really simple to submit a lead. Same thing, really, really simple to apply for a role. You don't need to have them recreate the resume for a job application. All you need is contact info. Name, phone number, email, that's it. And the same response that we have to our clients and our, our potential prospects, where we get back to them really quickly because we're more likely to get a sale, same thing with job seekers. The qualified job seekers are not on the market long. We have to get back to them, those folks, quickly. All right, any questions on career branding? I do. Yeah, please. Uh, so I'm going to go with what you just said as far as making it simple for them to apply. We, we do something to kind of weed out the, the weirdos. Um, <laughs> We we ask them to, to, to tell us something when they send us an email. Okay. Like, okay, so we just hired uh, a new production guy, and we have a very detailed job posting. If you go to our website, you can review it if you like. I would love it actually. But we ask for like what the real name of Steve Urkel is because we're all '90s babies, right? Like, so what's the real name of Steve Urkel, or what's uh, Lisa Turtle's um, uh, crush, like things like that, right? To, to weed out, to make sure they actually read? Do you agree or disagree with that? Like, <laughs> like we do random what, questions. What's, what's right? your reasoning behind doing this? Just be, to make sure they're reading posts and not just sending resumes. Okay. Heck okay. resume. I don't, I don't hate it. Yeah. Um, 
again, it's like a lead form. I want to make it as easy as, as possible for them to apply. And if you do that second step of our process, that pre-screen, you'll be able to weed out all those folks. Because if you send them a follow-up email and ask them to fill out 10 questions, if they don't care about the job, they're not filling it out. I got you. I don't hate it, though. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about team structure real quick. We're starting to see a lot of business organizations shift from traditional sales organization where you have salespeople doing everything. Prospecting, building a book of business, closing deals, uh, managing customer support, and ongoing maintenance of customers. There is very, very few salespeople that are good at all those things. Some of the folks, salespeople on our teams are probably thinking about they're good at the front end of the process and closing a deal, but they can't follow up and can't support customers worth anything. A lot of times we'll split these roles now, and we're seeing especially uh, tech companies, there's individual folks that all they do is prospect and, and set meetings, <coughs> door openers, appointment setters, they're called business development reps. Then there's a role that tip traditionally is called the account executive. All they do is close business. They, they do discovery needs analysis and close and get orders. And then you have those people that support your customers, follow up, maintenance, management, and try to upsell and sell them more. There's a lot of advantages to that type of role structure. Number one, specialization. If I'm good at one of those steps in the sales process, I as a leader want that person doing that all day, every day. They should not be following up with customers if they're not good at it. But if they're good at prospecting, they should be doing that all day. So this book, I was really fortunate to read early on in my tenure at Hierology. It was the first VP of sales at salesforce.com. Uh, Predictable Revenue is, is the book, and it's, it's about how to create the structure of little sales pods, essentially, which one pod would be a business development rep, an account executive, and then an account manager following up with the customers. A little bit of a different way to look at it, but we're seeing way more specialization and then way more accountability because they're, they're only accountable for one part of the sales process. Um, what, we, what I messed up early on is I didn't put enough focus and emphasis on support and follow-up and account management for customer success. <laughs> We, we were just worried about getting as many customers on as quick as we could, and before we knew it, our churn was out of control. People were using us, and then they'd shut it off. I didn't do two things. Number one, I didn't assign an individual role to support that position. I was kind of doing it, and our account executives were kind of doing it. So there wasn't someone that owned it and was accountable of following up. And number two, there was no process around what follow-up looked like. It was just check-ins. There wasn't structured you know, monthly business reviews where we talked about the success and the value we're adding to their business. It was kind of ad hoc and all over the place. So an important component, I know we all want to sell more and build our businesses. It's so much easier to keep a customer and get more business from them than it is to get a new customer in the door. I want to walk real quick through our sales process, and I'll share this document as well. So, before I was at Hireology, I worked for a sales consultancy, and we would go in and create and develop sales process for our clients, and then train their salespeople um, on how to run it. So I created this, um, we call our sales process uh, a treasure map, so if you follow the treasure, if you follow the process of these two. Treasure, mission, money. All right, so we had, these are the steps in our sales process. Lead generation, demo scheduling, discovery or group analysis, running a demo, negotiation to follow up and then close and grow the business. Your sales process is obviously a lot different than this, but there's steps, there's stages in it, right? From initial outreach to learning and understanding about their business needs assessment to doing your first run or whatever that next step is, the close, to then following and growing the business. My recommendation is we have to draw this out. We have to map out what our process is and really understand the steps and the stages and then what makes each step or each stage successful and what we shouldn't do. So I find very few small businesses have this mapped out. I didn't even do it for hireology, even though I did it at a business before until way too late. I was hiring salespeople so quickly they had no idea what we were doing or what our sales process was. I had to sit down and, and build and develop this out. So just to give you an idea of the stages, essentially in each one it's going to talk about what person on the team owns the stage what the customer is expecting there, what the goal of that stage is, or what we want as an outcome, and then the specific tasks and activities that are important and critical in that part of the sales process. Also, what tools and resources do the salespeople have at their disposal to make sure that they're running this process effectively, or this stage effectively? And then what I think is most important 
is what are the best practices in this stage? What should we be doing and following every time to make sure that we're running the right, the right approach? And what pitfalls should we be making sure that we're not stepping into? What are things that makes the sales in this stage go awry? Ultimately, this is just a document, but what I found is that if we, if we do document it, it makes, it makes the whole process so much easier. So think about it. When you're hiring or training or onboarding salespeople, you can give them an idea and tell them what best practices are and what to do in a needs analysis or discovery, but, but if they don't have a document to follow and a process to follow, it makes it that much more difficult. So the easiest way to do this is really just notate and, and document what you're doing today. And you could do uh, maybe like a win-loss analysis. Think about some um, deals that you won and situations or opportunities that you lost and try to really understand why, what happened. What did you or did you not do? And just try to think about what are the best practices in each stage of, of the sales process and the pitfalls that we should stay away from. Uh, it helps with consistency, it helps with deal strategy too. So if, if your salespeople are coming back to you asking, hey, I feel like I'm losing this, you know, what should we do? You can now be on the same page because you can understand what part of the sales process they're in or what part they aren't. All right, target market. I know a lot of us have specific segments or specific targets that we focus on, restaurants, schools, organizations, et cetera. What I found in my experience is that if we, if we get really, really tight and get as narrow as we can on the core vertical that fits best for our organization that we have the most success in, and we put more time and effort into marketing and, and creating value in that, that business, that, that segment or market, way more successful we're gonna be. When I started at Hireology in my infinite wisdom, I, I said that we were gonna be the recruiting and hiring platform for small and mid-sized businesses. That's not a target market, that's like 95% of all businesses in America. <laughs> So within two years, we decided on franchise businesses was gonna be our core vertical. And within a year after that, because we got specialized. So I had about 12 salespeople at that point. Overnight, everyone started calling only on franchise-based businesses. We just turned the ships. Everybody's only calling on franchise. Within a year, we were the, the most widely used hiring platform in franchising. Because all of our marketing went into that. All of our sales outreach went into that. We, pub we publicized stuff in every media channel of franchise and went to every conference. We just got really, really good at speaking their language and, and focusing on that niche. So think about subsets or verticals of, of folks in your, your geography that you target. Is there a specific niche that there's a big enough chunk of business that you can really, really focus on and be that shop that supports this, this vertical or this target? Can make a difference if you get really, really good at it. Um, and then finally, lead generation. Uh, data is cheap now, so if you don't have, I mean, you guys were talking about how many contacts you have in the database. If you don't have it and you want more, just buy it. Data is cheap, and there's a lot of resources to find um, organizations like data.com. We used Info USA as a product called Sales Genie. It can get really, really granular on type of organizations, revenue band, geographic location. If you don't already have those, that data, those lead lists, I would recommend buying it. All right, with that, um, as Bruce knows, I, I love talking about this stuff. So on the side, I also run a, a small sales consultancy and help entrepreneurs and, and early stage businesses and um, small businesses on sales strategies and how to build and develop their business. So if you have any questions outside of today, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I love talking about this stuff. Any questions before I leave? Thanks all for having me.